Madame Lévesque, j'ai piqué. Ok. Oui, ça bien été, ça va. There you go. With that, 89-year-old Giselle Levesque became the first Canadian to be vaccinated for COVID-19 today. Levesque got her first shot at her long-term care home in Quebec City just after 11 o'clock this morning. S such a simple procedure after such a complicated national ordeal. There are still so many questions surrounding this new COVID-19 vaccine. And as the first doses begin to roll out, our inboxes have been flooded with your questions. So let's bring back Dr. Chagla and Dr. Barrett to help us answer them. The very first question comes in from Chris out of Burlington. So the question is, must the standard personal protection methods, we're talking masks, distancing and hand washing, continue after both stages of inoculation are completed? Dr. Barrett, this one's for you. Yeah, so the results we have so far, which are early from the vaccine, demonstrate that this vaccine seems to work at least in the short term and after you've had two doses. Although it works or seems to, what we also know is not that much about how long and how effective it is until we get a whole bunch of people around us vaccinated. And so while it would be very tempting to get rid of all of the hand washing, masking and distancing, at least for the first few months after the first few people are vaccinated, it would be very, very prudent for folks to maintain those very simple but really important public health measures. So this is just the way we're gonna have to live for a while. A little while, but you know what? We've got a horizon now, and boy, how good does that feel? Yeah, no kidding. All right, second question here. It's a video question from Shelley Simmons out of Toronto. I understand that it is unknown if the vaccine will need to be readministered in future years, um, but I'm wondering how can that be tested so that people can uh, feel confident after they get the vaccine? Okay, Dr. Chagla, that, that's actually a really good question. H how do we know? Yeah. Fantastic question. And there's going to be a number of things done. One is, is that original data set that got the vaccine in the phase three trials, the ones that we're seeing released right now, they're also going to be followed out to see what their responses look like at six months, a year. Uh, and so they're going to be kind of that that future teller for us to say what what does the vaccine profile look like in the general population as time moves on. We're also going to see it in ourselves too, and we'll get a sense again of antibodies level, antibody levels drop. If we're seeing some cases show up in people that have been immunized, I think we'll get a sense that, that uh, what what our level of immunity is going to be at a year or two years or three years, and, and again, when would we need to consider a boost? Or hopefully, at that point, we have different treatments, we have other vaccines, and so other strategies that may be put on the table at that point. Okay, just a quick follow-up, Dr. Chagla. If it's established that we need to take the vaccine once yearly, what, let's say every March you have to take it, what happens in, in the January and February? Is, is it your sense that our immunity will diminish or do we just not know that yet? Yeah, I mean, we don't know. And, and it, it is complicated in other features. So it's not only just the vaccine that necessarily gets our immunity up. We know from other vaccine models, from things like hepatitis B, from chicken pox, you know, it's not only getting the vaccine, but it's also getting exposed to the virus again that sometimes brings up our immune response and makes us more protected as things go on. So uh, I wouldn't say that if the vaccine lasts 12 months and all of a sudden at 10 months, everyone is susceptible again, there's going to be different set points for different people based on their immune system, their genetics, and again, what they've been re-exposed to to kind of boost their own natural immune response. Okay, thank you. Humans are complicated, aren't they? Very. <laughs> uh, Dr. Barrett, why don't you take this next question? This is from uh, Emily Clark in Oshawa. What about those of us who have autoimmune diseases? When can we expect to be vaccinated? Thanks. It's such a good question and one that, I mean, a lot of people will find themselves in that group, but also other people who, who aren't even in the line to get vaccinated. Kids under 16, pregnant women, all in the same category. Absolutely. So... I mean, I think we need to remember just for a moment, uh, Emily had a great question there, but this is day 349 since we've identified the first cases of this virus, and now we have a vaccine. So we don't know, we know about the vast majority of the population, how they might respond, but we don't know about people who are in the sides of the population, the minority folks who didn't get included, people with autoimmune disease, those pregnant, those less than 16, people who are immunocompromised. And it's great that we've got this vaccine, 
but we don't have enough information yet to broadly put it out to everyone unless there are special circumstances for people in those categories where they can't do the things, hand washing, distancing, right. masking, that can be safe. It so long story short, it's going to take a little while and a little bit more information before we can broadly spread the vaccine out to those folks. But hopefully within the next four to six months, we'll have more information as we move forward. It does make me curious, though, whether it's plausible or reasonable to think that there would be a risk for those folks if they did get the vaccine. Sure. And the amazing part about this vaccine is that it's a brand new platform in humans. These vaccines, uh, these RNA or mRNA vaccine platforms have been used in animals uh, and in different situations, but this is the first time in humans. Does that make it scary? Well, no, I think the clinical trials have been well run and the safety part looks good, but we do need to be a little bit careful about being prudent. Don't forget, when we do vaccinations, we have a very high standard for making sure we do no harm. Right. And for the vast majority of folks, I think we've shown that this is safe. For those other folks in those other populations, we need a little bit more time to make it as safe as possible for those folks. But let's not forget, lots of other people getting the vaccine will also help to protect those around them. And so that's an important part of everyone else getting the vaccine. It helps protect those who can't get this one yet. Hollerack sent us a question. It is, once vaccinated, will we still have to isolate for two weeks after returning back to Canada? So, Dr. Chagla, how about you for this one? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. And I think this goes back to some of those concepts we were talking about earlier. We know this vaccine uh, reduces symptomatic COVID-19, but we still don't know precisely whether or not this vaccine actually reduces shedding of people with COVID-19. Knowing what's go going on globally, it's going to be hard to assume the latter until the evidence is proven. And so until we get that data that this, this vaccine essentially prevents people from shedding COVID-19, those quarantine requirements may be around or tagged to some sort of testing to make sure that people aren't infectious when they're returning to Canada. Okay, quick follow-up to that, Dr. Chagla. A few weeks ago, there was some suggestion the CDC was reconsidering the length mm -hmm. of the quarantine time. Any updates on that? Yeah, I mean, the CDC has put out their statement towards seven days with a test and 10 days without. I think Canadian governments and, and provincial health authorities are starting to look at this. Um, it is a compromise between, uh, you know, the 1% potentially sneaking out and causing infection versus getting the other 99% to tolerate a quarantine period. So uh, I think given the pressures, we'll probably see some, some leverage towards this soon, making, you know, evidence-based decisions to see if this fits here in Canada. Okay. We've got a video question. Dr. Barrett, maybe I'll have you take this one. This is from Brindley Fellows out of uh, here in Toronto. Will high school students be able to attend in-person school full-time once we get the vaccine? Ah, well, it's a good question again, and I love that uh, folks in high school are so eager to get back to high school. Uh, <laughs> never had an eager group to get back to school. It's wonderful. Um, I guess that depends not just on the vaccine. Again, uh, to Dr. Chagla's point, you know, we'd have to figure out if this vaccine is going to give us some immunity or complete immunity. So people may still shed, we're not sure yet. But also we need enough people immunized that going back into a classroom is a protected environment. And also it depends on the amount of virus that's still in our communities around us. So if not everyone is vaccinated, we need to judge what the risk is based on the number of people around in the community that are infected. If the viral temperature, if you will, is high in the community, then we're going to have to make sure many, many people are vaccinated and that we're into a, a stage where we can still have some precautions in school. So it's not really a great answer, but hopefully the answer is sooner and much sooner than if we didn't have the vaccine. Right. And Adrian, I guess, I mean, high school is interesting because you've got a lot of kids who are under 16. Who, uh, who won't be getting the vaccine anytime soon, which further drags out the timeline. Yeah. Uh, we have a similar question. It's from Luther B, who asks, what if only half the population is vaccinated? How much of it of the population has to be vaccinated to achieve herd immunity? Very briefly, Dr. Chakla? Yeah, so much in the modeling, and again, this is on the presumption that the vaccine prevents people from infecting other people, which we haven't established yet. 
if that really is the case, we're thinking about 70% of the population needs to get that vaccine. But it's dependent on, again, that fact that it prevents person-to-person -person spread, but also that the vaccine functions relatively how it did in the clinical trials when it gets rolled out in the population. So a lot of factors there, but yeah, probably 70% of the population that needs to get it before we say we've achieved herd immunity and we can protect the people that can't get it or don't make a response to it. All right. Again, both of you, thank you very, very much. Lots of great questions tonight, as always. And please keep them coming. You can message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National or you can send us an email at covid at cbc.ca.